Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last for this season Zoom lecture from the Emeritus Academy. Um, I wanted to say spring has sprung. You can see back here behind me, my husband's tree peonies are starting to bloom already. Um, mm -hmm. And if anybody's really interested, he has like 17 of them welcome to come over and he'll give you a grand tour of the yard. Um, I wanted to say a few things before we got going today and a little bit about what we might expect for in the autumn. You probably did notice or hopefully received the newsletter yesterday sent out from the Academy email address. If not, it's also a uh, going to be posted at the Academy website. In there is the outline for next year for the lecture series. We don't know at this point and won't know for a while yet whether we're going to be Zoom or a hybrid version with in-person and Zoom or exactly how this is all going to work out. So we have to ask you to stay tuned through summer and pay attention please to any emails that you receive coming in from the Academy as we try and keep you up to date on what's happening. Um, before I go on and introduce our 11 new members, I wanted to say something about a few of the steering committee folks that will be retiring, <laughs> leaving us from steering. Um, of course, there it is, the right paper here. Um, so leaving steering is both Jack Rawl and Russ Pitzer. And I wanted to especially thank, I think, Jack for suggesting the whole idea of the newsletter because I think it's been important to help everybody stay aware of what their colleagues are up to since we weren't able to meet in person. But the person that was stuck with the job of uh, taking care of the newsletter is Joe Donemeyer, who is a past chair. He is uh, fourth year on the committee and he will be stepping away. And I'm a little um, perturbed about this whole thing with Jack because what it means is next year when I become the past chair fourth year person, I'm going to have to do the newsletter. So uh, look for an email call for information for the newsletter sometime uh, late August, probably. Uh, start writing those things down that you might want to submit for newsletter information. Um, so then to move on to our next piece of business for today, we have 11 new members and uh, in the newsletter, there is a, a more extensive writing uh, about their research than what I'm going to actually say today. What you're seeing on the screen right now is those persons um, that have newly been accepted in their departments. Our first person is Ann Carey. Is she with us today? There, yay! Everyone, I am. <laughs> Uh, she comes to us from the School of Earth Science. Her research includes the relationship between weathering and landscape evolution in the transport of sol solutes and sediment. Did I say that right? Primarily in small mountainous rivers, the role of urbanization and of agriculture on water quality, determination of geochemical mass balances on the watershed scale, coastal aquifer dynamics, and permafrost hydrology, and the impact of climate change on water resources. It's that last phrase that I was like, wow, okay, very important. I can't wait until you give us a lecture sometime in the future about this topic. So welcome, Anne. Thank you. Um, next, Elizabeth Davis. Is she with us? There. Oh. Greetings, Elizabeth. 
Uh, she comes to us from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Her scholarship focuses primarily on poetry, the novel, and nonfiction narrative 16th and 17th century Spanish literature. Welcome to the Academy. That's me. Hi, everybody. Um, next is uh, Karen Elliott. There. Greetings, Helen. Uh, Karen, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, here we go. Department of Dance. And uh, let me see. Look around the corner is a choreographic text that includes ample historical and contextual information about Merce Cunningham. His repertory and his teaching in chore choreographic processes. Um, I hope sometime in the future, you will give us a lecture about this and perhaps do a little dancing. You're muted. So if you said anything, Karen, I, I could not hear it. I'll bring some students along perhaps. That, I think that would really be fun at the faculty club or out in front of the faculty club and have the students dance. I think it'd be terrific. Well, our next new member is Bernard Fish, Fisher from the Department of Dramatic Languages and Literature. He's working on se in several areas, including transcultural theory and literary, literary analysis. Welcome, Bernhardt. Hi. Hi. I'm glad you could be with us today. Um, next, we have Earl Harrison from the Department of Human Sciences. He'll be serving as a consultant or co-investor investigator on numerous research grants exploring various issues in human nutritional research. Uh, the next person is William Lofuse from the College of Medicine. Is he with us? Yes. Greetings. Greetings. Welcome. William or do you go by Bill? Huh? Do you go by William or Bill. by Bill? Bill. Bill, okay. Well, greetings. Um, micro infection in immunology. His research is focused on studying the interaction of pathogens with an immune system and recently has also included the SARS COVID-2 virus. So you're doing some really important work right now that we're all dependent on. Welcome to the Academy. Almost as much as before the got retired. <laughs> <laughs> that that happens, you know, many people say once you retire, well, you don't have to go to faculty meetings or deal with students. Now you can just do your research. Um, next is Terrell Morgan. Good afternoon, Terrell. Hey. He's from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. When he, he retired, no fewer than five major projects were left unfinished. He's going to continue working on three of them. Um, glad to have you with us. Thank you. The next person is Morton O'Kelly. Don't know if he's here. Maybe not. He's from the De Department of Geography. He is continuing publications in the area of location theory transportation, spatial interaction models, and quantitative methods. Um, also from his application, I think he would be an incredibly interesting lecture at some point in the next year or two. Well, actually all our new members would be. Uh, the next person is Chan Park from the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature. Good Hello. Welcome. Yeah. Um, you, uh, she is completing her second monograph on Pansori. Did I say that right? Korean yeah. traditional story singing. Mm -hmm. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> um, I can't wait to know more about that. 
Thanks. Welcome to the Academy. Um, two more people to introduce. The next person person is Vish. I'm going to try and say it right. Subramaniam. <laughs> Would you say your last name for me, please? Sure. It's a Subramaniam. Subramaniam. Yeah. Okay. Um, he's from the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Vish has focused on biomedical sciences and specifically on bioelectricity, including interactions of low frequency electromagnetic waves with cells and tissues with applications in detection and imaging of solid tumors, controlling cell migration and metastasis. Welcome to the Academy. And our 11th person is James Todd from there. Good afternoon, welcome uh, from the Department of Psychology. And he will focus primarily on two central issues of perception. First, how observers achieve stable perceptions of 3D shape over variations in surface materials or the pattern of illumination. And second, how we are able to identify surface materials for objects with different shapes and patterns of illumination. Someday I'd love to talk, I'm a photographer, so I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, welcome to the Academy. Thank you. Glad to be here. And as I mentioned, a, a more full-blown description of their research is part of the newsletter. So please take a look at that. Um, next are, <laughs> I was going to call her a fearless leader. I don't know if I should say that or not, but Vice Provost Helen Malone, our support person, our, our advocate in OAA would like to say a few words. Helen? Thanks, Ardeen. Uh, you can call me fearless. You just, I was just um, joking earlier that I, that I do have fears, just not, not, uh, not a lot of them. So anyway, welcome to all of our new members. I wanted to uh, jump on today and say, you know, we're so uh, pleased to have our new members join us here. Um, the Emeritus Academy is um, an organization that really does help us promote our emeritus faculty who continue to engage in research, to engage with the community. Um, you'll be able to look for some small uh, grant applications in the, in the near future. And I want to echo what uh, our dean said about the autumn, that we don't really know what's coming, but, but I'm going to echo um, Bruce McFerrin here. And just encourage everybody, if you're able to, to get your vaccine, the more people we have vaccinated, the more likely we'll be able to come back to campus and have more in-person activities. So I strongly encourage you uh, to, to get a vaccine if you're able to. Uh, we do hope that as the fall approaches that we'll be able to have some in-person activities. Uh, it would be lovely to get everybody back in the faculty club so that you all could spend some time uh, in person. But I will say this last year over Zoom, uh, the, the lectures have been equally good in the Zoom space as they, mm -hmm. you just miss that in-person space. So welcome to the Academy. If ever there's anything that OAA can do to be supportive, please reach out. I'm happy to, to talk and have a conversation. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it back to our Dean. Thank you, Helen. Um, we appreciate your kind words and offer of support. As always, she's very, very supportive of us. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce our lecture for this afternoon, Professor David Hiram. Uh, the title of his lecture, I don't know if that's going to pop up on the screen right now, is The Science of Sad Sounds, How and Why Many People Enjoy Listening to Sad Music. Um, as a bio, for more than a century, the Ohio State University has been a world leader in the psychological study of music. For 22 years, Dr. David Huron continued that tradition running the Cognitive and Systematic Musicology Laboratory in the OSU School of Music. Professor Huron is well known in the field of music cognition. 
He has received multiple Lifetime Achievement in Publication Awards and has given over 400 invited lectures in 28 countries. Dr. Hearn is a notable, has had a notable impact on the training of scholars in the field of music psychology. In the year of his retirement, 2019, some 350 papers were presented at the Society for Music Perception and Cognition Conference in New York City. Of those presentations, more than one in 10 involved authors who had been directly trained by Dr. Huron. Uh, we are, I am looking forward to your lecture and I'm sure everyone is. You're on. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, well, th thank you for that introduction and welcome everybody. It's nice to see some familiar faces uh, in, the, in the crowd as well. Um, I should begin by acknowledging uh, uh, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, uh, coll research collaborators and uh, visiting scholars and so on who have all participated in the research that we've done over the years on uh, music and sadness. We've done all, all sorts of other kinds of research as well, but that's the topic of what I'm going to talk about uh, today. So uh, our research shows that about 50% of the general population enjoys listening to music that people would generally call sad music. Um, that also means that about 50% of the population don't enjoy listening to sad music. And radio stations know this, for example, that uh, they don't play much sad music on the radio because they lose typically half of their audience once they start, uh, once they start doing that. So the question that, uh, and you find people who will say things like, I never listen to sad music uh, because it makes me feel like committing suicide. This was one of our respondents to one of our, our surveys. For about 10% of listeners, sad music is the music that they will say they most enjoy. There's something about the music that really touches them. And so, so there's something special about nominally sad music. At the same time, there's a kind of paradox here. Um, as philosopher Stephen Davies has said, if sad music makes people feel sad, why on earth would they bother to listen? So sadness is considered in the emotion literature, a classic example of a negatively valenced emotion. People normally don't want to feel sad. So what's the appeal uh, of sad music? So two questions that arise here. The first is what makes something sound sad? If we're talking about music, we might say, what are the features of a, a musical passage that people say, yeah, that, that makes it sound sad. And then the second um, more aesthetic question is why do some people enjoy nominally sad music while others don't? So I'm gonna divide my, uh, my presentation here this afternoon into two parts. Part one, we're gonna address the question of what makes something sound sad. And part two, we're gonna address the question of why some people would find this enjoyable. Okay, so part one, what makes uh, something sound sad? In Western musical culture, there's a long uh, history of linking happy music and sad music with uh, the two predominant scales of, the, of Western culture, namely the major scale and the minor scale. So I think uh, a good place to start might be to illustrate this, especially for those of you who, are, who aren't musicians or musically oriented and want to know what is, what is the difference between major and minor. Uh, I'm going to play a, a couple of examples here. And uh, through the miracle of modern signal processing, uh, Olag Berg has done some uh, little work here, where we're going to take a popular song called La Bamba, the, the Los Lobos uh, group out of Los Angeles, playing it. Th this was originally recorded in the major mode, but we're going to be able to shift uh, the music into the minor mode, and we'll alternate back and forth between the major and the minor, so you can hear the contrast between these two, what we call modes, or you can think of them as a scale. And a scale is just a, um, comes from the, uh, the Italian scala, which simply means ladder. It's a series of pitch steps that uh, constitute the repertoire of tones that can be used uh, when generating uh, music. Uh, okay, so uh, watch your screen, listen to the music, and you'll see major come up and minor come up. You, when the word major comes up, you should hear that the music sounds sort of bright and a little bit happier, and that when the word minor comes, uh, comes up, you'll hear that it kind of darkens and starts sounding sadder. So could we, could we hear the first musical example?
Okay, so hopefully you were able to hear the contrast there between uh, the brighter or happier sounding major and nominally the sadder or darker sounding um, minor. I thought uh, because it would be a little bit of fun, I thought I would do one other example here. This is Bobby McFerrin's uh, Don't Worry, Be Happy. And uh, uh, actually you're gonna hear towards the end, we're gonna switch the words around. So instead of the words saying, don't worry, be happy, you're gonna hear don't happy, be worry. And again, we're going to flash up when it's in the major and when it's in the minor so that you can hear the difference between these two states. Okay, so can we hear the second example? song I wrote, you might want to sing it note for note, don't worry, be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry you make it up, be worried, don't be happy. Okay, so there, uh, this tradition of the major mode associated with happy and the minor mode associated with sadness has a number of problems associated with it. Mm -hmm. So the first is that the minor mode has other associations apart from sadness. So one of these is that the minor mode can sound more serious than sad. And so let's just listen to an excerpt here from, this is from Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata. And uh, it, this is entirely in the minor mode, but it's very difficult to describe it as sounding anything like sad. What it really sounds like is something sort of passionate and um, serious. So let's listen to that example then. Also, the minor mode is associated with another quality, too, of exoticness. And so for this example, this is the main theme from the film from the 1960s, uh, Lawrence of Arabia. And here you'll see, you, here you'll hear the use of the minor mode in a way that conjures up a kind of exotic quality to it. Again, it doesn't sound sad. Uh, it sounds mostly a kind of ex exotic quality to it. So let's listen to this example. Okay, um, the second problem with the minor mode is that there are no such sad associations in non-Western cultures. This is very strongly linked to the enculturated background of Westerners. So for example, a Jewish traditional song of Havan Aguila, that's uh, also in the minor mode, but uh, the, it's all about rejoicing, happy, 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 it's all about happiness. Um, and simply, uh, similarly, in traditional Bulgarian music, you find that the minor mode is used very extensively, or what Westerners would, uh, Western Europeans would think of as the minor mode, but it has, uh, you look at the lyrics and so forth and the character of the, of the music, it's not at all um, uh, sad uh, sounding. Um, we also have a handful of things in, uh, in Western culture, uh, like uh, God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen, a, a Christmas song that's in the minor mode, but also very happy in orientation. Also, uh, if we go back, the major and minor mode uh, have only existed in Western culture since well, roughly about 1600. And, and before that, there was a system of modes that was quite different. 
And the most common mode that existed at that time was something called the Dorian mode, which also happens to be of the ver various modes from that period, the one that most resembles the modern minor scale. And yet, if you read the descriptions of uh, writers from that period, you'll find that that was the happiest mode. That was the mode that people thought of as being uh, um, uh, the most positive in terms of its, its connotations. So clearly, uh, there's some cultural enculturation going on here. So uh, the problems of identifying sad music features is not limited to the apparent confusion associated with different scales or modes. There are problems also evident in pitch register, in the loudness of the sounds, and in whether the music tends to have a relaxed or tense kind of articulation. So uh, let's listen to two more passages here. This now is from a piece that people will generally think is very sad. In fact, the BBC World Service a number of years ago had a competition in which they at, asked people to vote on which they thought was the saddest piece of music in the world. And uh, the American composer Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings uh, won an outright majority in that, uh, in that uh, poll. Uh, so let's listen to, uh, consider these two passages here from Samuel Barber's Adagio for Strings. And let me warn you now, um, one of the things that I've learned from giving talks about music and sadness is when you play truly sad music, it has a great uh, effect of sort of bumming out your audience. It's, it's, not, it's a pretty sad piece of music. So can we hear this, uh, the first example from the Barber? And uh, okay, let's just. So much sad music resembles just what you've heard there, music that is quiet, that's low in overall pitch, that's very slow, and in this case is in the minor mode. But the most emotional passages are often loud, high pitched, intense, and even in the major mode. And so, um, Jason, can we hear the next example? This is also from Barber's Adagio for Strings, but it's later on in the piece of music. So let's listen to this. Okay, so major or minor, fast or slow, loud or quiet, high or low, are there any stable acoustical features that are characteristic of sad music? As we just heard in, in Barbara's Adagio, we heard a passage that was low and slow and quiet that was very sad, but we also heard this other passage that was high and intense and loud, and that was also very, very moving emotionally with regard to a kind of sadness. So we can gain some insight into this by following a distinction that Charles Darwin made in his work on uh, emotions. And that is there's a distinction here between two forms of sadness. What uh, Darwin called sadness versus sorrow, but what we're going to characterize or use the terms melancholy and grief. So what is melancholy? Uh, melancholy is characterized by low physiological arousal. Your facial Facial features tend to be relaxed, um, low heart rate, shallow respiration, slumped posture, a change of appetite. People tend to sleep a lot. Uh, mute, that is when people are in a melancholic mood, they tend not to say much or anything at all. Reduced engagement in the world. And people tend to think about life station issues, about you know, whether they're in the right relationship or in the right career path and so on. Now that's very different than another uh, form of sadness we can call grief. And this is associated with high physiological arousal and high heart rate, erratic respiration, flushed face, tears, nasal congestion, a constriction of the pharynx, 
the vocalization that can go for anything from just quiet sobbing to very loud wailing and something we call ingressive vocal, um, vocalizing, which is when you tend to gasp. So at the end of a crying episode, <laughs> they'll breathe in while they're vocalizing, which is a rather rare thing uh, to do. So what we need to do is actually consider the acoustical features for melancholy and for grief separately. They're two different kinds of experiences. So Emil Kraepelin, often regarded as one of the founders of modern psychiatry, uh, and who was also, by the way, a musician, gave the first really detailed description of a melancholic or depressed um, speech sound. So noted that it's a quieter voice. There is a slower speaking rate when people are melancholic. There tends to be a lower overall pitch to the voice. Smaller pitch movement, that means that people tend to speak with a sort of monotone voice, rather than having the pitch go up and down, uh, it tends to be very flat. Um, poor articulation, which is to say that when people are sad or depressed, they tend to mumble, they're not moving their lips very much. Um, and then modern research adds two more features to uh, sad or melancholic speech, a breathy voice and a darker timbre. Uh, uh, so if I put my hands in front of my face and bark on the sound, that uh, is also characteristic of these things. Uh, incidentally, uh, just uh, as a point along the way here, we're talking about ordinary sadness here, or ordinary melancholy, uh, as opposed to depression. So depression really is a, a separate thing. It, there are good things about being having a sad experience, but depression is not one of them. It's a pathology. Now, um, so in a whole series of studies that we've done, we've shown that melancholic music is indeed quieter that it's slower in pace or tempo, that it's lower in overall pitch, that sad music tends to have a, a, a narrow pitch contour, tends to be more monotone, if you wish. Um, mm -hmm. Sad music mumbles, and I suppose the musical equivalent of mumbling would be to play something in a legato fashion as opposed to a staccato punctuated fashion. And sad music makes use of darker timbres as well. So uh, there are certain instruments. We've done studies about how uh, certain instruments are more suited to playing sadness or conveying sadness than other mm -hmm. instruments. And number one is the cello. That's the one that uh, is, uh, people deem to be most capable of generating a sad sound, followed by the human voice. It's interesting that an instrument actually beats out the voice here, followed by the violin, the viola, the English horn ranks here at number seven, the acoustic guitar is number nine, uh, the marimba at 25, the banjo is much further down the list, the xylophone, and uh, the triangle here of the 40 instruments that we, that we looked at. What I'd like to draw your attention to is these two instruments here, the marimba and the xylophone. Both of these are mallet percussion instruments made out of wood. They're quite similar, um, but they have different uh, qualities to them. The xylophone has a much brighter timbre than the marimba. The marimba has a, a darker sound to it. And the xylophone also has a shorter tone duration. So when you whack the, the thing, it makes a kind of plink sound. On the marimba, if you go, if you whack it, it'll go, it'll be more of a sustained kind of sound as well. So we did a study uh, comparing music for xylophone and marimba, and we found that um, of the repertoire, there's a huge repertoire for these instruments, but fully 94% of the music written for the xylophone is in the major mode. That is, it's associated with this kind of happy comp component to it. Uh, whereas only 40% of the music written for marimba is in the major mode. That is to say 60% of the music written for the marimba, which with it has the darker timbre and so forth, is written in the minor mode conducive to trying to generate a sadder kind of sound. Um, Steve Martin, a well-known comedian, but also an excellent uh, banjo player, made a famous statement, you can't play sad music on the banjo, and there's an awful lot of truth to that. It's very difficult because, first of all, the instrument sound is rather bright uh, sounding. Uh, also, the tones uh, tend not to sustain very long, so you're kind of forced into playing fast music. Why are some instruments better suited for playing sad music than others? And can we predict the judge sadness of an instrument on the basis of its acoustical properties? And the answer is yes. If we look at the capacity of the instrument to bend pitches, this is, turns out to be important. The, the ability to sustain tones over a longer period of time. The spectral centroid, this is just a, simply a measure of the darkness of the sound. This is a brighter sound, this is a darker sound. This has a higher spectral centroid, a lower spectral centroid. How low the instrument can play, so generally lower pitched instruments are able to generate uh, sadder sound than higher pitched instruments, and how quietly the instrument can play. So some instruments are just naturally loud, like the trombone, and it makes it more difficult to pr produce a sadder sound. 
So we've been talking now about melancholic kinds of sounds, and now we can go over and talk about grief. What are the sounds of grief? So it's loud, tends to be high pitched, gliding. I suppose I should probably illustrate. Here, let's go through the list first of all, and, and, and let me illustrate these. So what's the sound of grief? The sound of grief is this. <laughs> okay, um, that's probably enough of a demonstration. Uh, obviously loud, of course, there's also uh, some more um, uh, quieter forms of grief. Uh, you notice that it was a higher pitch than what happens for melancholic, uh, gliding off and descending pitches, a constriction of the pharynx, which uh, tends to lead to this sort of pinched sound to it, uh, this gasping, which we talked about earlier, the punctuated exhaling, which uh, grief shares in common with laughter. So basically the difference between laughter and, and uh, uh, crying is whether you smile or not. <laughs> uh, so that just transforms the sound from one to the other. And there's a nice uh, physiological uh, reason for these things. Um, uh, then breaking voice. So right now I'm speaking in what's called modal voice. Now I'm speaking in falsetto voice. So I can alternate back and forth between modal and falsetto. So I go, so now if I go modal to falsetto and, and now a very characteristic component or aspect to the grief uh, sound is this breaking, <laughs> uh, which is this uh, instability between modal and falsetto phonation. Now, breaking voice can be heard in lots of different musical genres, including opera and country music. And I think what we might do is just uh, listen to an example of the use of breaking voice in a piece of music. This is the Johnson Mountain Boys playing Blue Diamond Mines. And Jason, I think we've got a, an example coming up here. What you're going to do here is hear the, the complete phrase of them singing. And then you're going to hear a, an isolated bit to draw attention to the specific part that I mean of where the voice is breaking. And then you'll hear an even shorter example of that just to make it clear what we mean by breaking voice. Uh, Jason, can we hear the next example then? Okay, so there you heard an example of this cracking or breaking voice that's uh, common uh, in these, these, these forms. Okay, what we found is that breaking voice is correlated with grief related content in the lyrics. So there's a strong uh, association that would you might expect to have uh, happen. This happens in lots of different genres of music, not just uh, country music, but uh, also in, uh, in opera, for example. Okay, let's return now uh, to consider the low pitch we talked about with regard to um, melancholic sound. So there's a, an ethologist, a famous ethologist who worked out of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington named Eugene Morton, who examined vocalizations in a whole bunch of different species, very contrasting species. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he showed was something called uh, size symbolism. Let's back off for a minute here and, 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 uh, and, and, and put some context to this. So if, uh, if an animal wants to appear aggressive, or threatening, typically it tries to fluff up and make itself look big. Think of a cat arching its back and making its hair stand on end or a bear looming up on its back legs and so forth. Conversely, when we are trying to be affiliative, friendly or appeasing, we do the reverse. We tend to try to make ourselves smaller. So a dog, when it's being appeasing, will uh, crouch down and put its tail between its legs and attempt to appear smaller. So this is the size symbolism here of uh, aggression versus affiliation. There's a similar thing that can happen with regard to sound. So it's not just visual. One of the best generalizations one can make acoustically is that a large mass or a large resonant cavity will vibrate at a lower frequency than a small uh, cavity or small uh, mass. So um, and we can see the same thing that, ha that happens with regard to, to pitch. So the pitch of the voice, uh, if I lower the pitch of my voice, now it starts sounding aggressive and forward. And on the other hand, if I lift the pitch of my voice and I put it up there, it sounds more uh, friendly, more, more appeasing. Uh, work by a linguist Dwight Bollinger has done cross-cultural work, which shows this is a universal human uh, characteristic to, uh, to speech. 
uh, speech prosody. So high pitch is associated with submission, politeness or friendliness, and low pitch is associated with aggression or seriousness. Uh, so the effect isn't just limited to pitch, it's also uh, evident in uh, vocal resonance. So for example, we can take a, a low vowel, if I puff out my lips here and make a O, o sound, which is a large cavity here, as opposed to if I put my chin up and my tongue high and I go an E sound, this is a high resonance. And notice now I can independently vary the pitch and the resonance here. So I can have a high pitch and a high resonance, E, I can have a high pitch and a low resonance, U, I can have a low pitch and a high resonance, E, and I can have a low pitch and a low resonance, O. Okay, so these are ind independent. Mm -hmm. uh, the linguist uh, John O'Hala um, was able to solve a long-standing problem in uh, the history of emotion and facial expressions, and that has to do with the smile, the human smile. When you think about it, why on earth should uh, showing your teeth, displaying your teeth, be anything construed as anything other than an aggression display? What is it about a smile that makes it uh, appeasing or friendly? And the answer is, it doesn't have anything to do with how you look. It has to do with how you sound. The thing about a smile is that you can hear it. And so another part then to the resonance here is what's called the vocal tract length. So from the vocal folds up to the tip of the lips is essentially a tube. And we can uh, we have a little bit of opportunity to lengthen the tube or to shorten the tube. We shorten the tube, the resonance goes up and now it starts sounding friendlier. We lengthen the tube, it makes the resonance go down and it starts sounding more aggressive. So the smile, what we're doing when we're smiling is using zygomatic muscles to pull the lips taut against the teeth and shorten the vocal tract length. And so the sound sounds higher. And, um, the, and Ohala pointed out that the opposite of the smile is not the frown. The opposite of the smile is the pout. And so now if I take my lips now and I extend the vocal tract length here, and now we end up with the Hollywood cliche sound of the hooligan. Right, I sound aggressive early when I'm not. Okay, so the opposite then of the smile, we're just extending or <laughs> retracting uh, our lips. So it applies not just to pitch, it also applies to resonance. Now in subsequent research, we've learned that the model that we just saw there, the acoustic ethology model can be refined by including loudness or intensity as another factor. So now we've got a, a four quadrants here. So high and quiet is associated with submission, politeness, and friendliness. High and loud is associated with fear or alarm. Low and quiet is associated with melancholic sadness, sleepiness, or relaxed. And low and loud is associated with seriousness or aggression. So we have these four uh, quadrants here. Okay, <clears throat> now if low pitch is sadder, shouldn't men sound depressed compared with women? <clears throat> In speech, we know that pitch is normalized to the range of the voice. So when we infer uh, what's going on with pitch contour, we, mm -hmm. we normalize it to whether that person typically has a, a low natural tessitura or range to the voice, whether it's moderate or high. So the question um, that happens with regard to sad or depressed is that the pitch of the voice is not just low, it's lower than what we expect. It's lower than normal. So I can listen to the sound of my, my sister has a higher pitch voice than my mother, but uh, I can tell that my sister is sad, even though the pitch of her voice may still not be as low as my mother's voice. Why? Because it's low compared with where she would normally place the pitch of her voice. So now the question arises, might the same thing happen with regard to music? So here now I'll describe just one of the many experiments that we've done here because it'll illustrate uh, how this works. What happens if we expose listeners to music in some novel scale for a period of time, and then ask them to judge the sadness of melodies in which one or more scale tones are lowered? Mm -hmm. Will listeners hear lower than normal scale tones as sounding sad? So here's how the experiment works. What we do is you, we use a computer to randomly generate a scale. The frequencies here are completely arbitrary. There's a limit on how close they can be, how far apart they can be, but this is not an equally tempered scale, has no relationship to Western uh, music. There's no octave equivalence. Just think of it as some sort of random sequence of pitches. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna select randomly one, two, or three of the tones in this hypothetical scale, and we're gonna lower them. And we're going to lower them by a random amount. This gets again some constraints here. So we started off with that original orange scale. I hope it appears on your screen as orange. And now we have a sort of bluish scale, which is derivative from that uh, original scale. Now what we're going to do is the exact opposite. We're going to take those same tones that we modified and raise them by the similar by a similar amount and generate a third scale. 
So now we have the original orange scale, the uh, bluish scale that's got some of the tones lowered, and the yellow scale in which it's got some of the tones, those same tones raised. Now what we're gonna do is just forget about that orange scale for now. And now what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, two participants. One participant is going to listen to a whole bunch of music in the bluish scale, and the other participant is going to listen to a whole, the, the same music played in uh, a yellow scale. Now, what do I mean by music? What they're going to be hearing is obscure German folk songs played in these wacky scales, and they're going to be played with a, an unusual timbre. They're going to be played on an African thumb piano, that is a kalimba. And so when you listen to these things, it sounds like some uh, strange exotic music from some culture you've never heard of, but it's because there are, there are German folk songs of the structure to them, it, it, it generally sounds like a real music. Now imagine you're going to be hearing half an hour of music in, uh, in either one of these scales, the two participants here, and, um, and after each uh, folk melody they're going to be asked to judge how sad does that melody sound. Now after half an hour of listening to this, now what we're going to do is have both of these participants listen to more obscure German folk songs played in the original orange scale. Now notice that the one who had been exposed to the one, the bluish scale is going to hear some of the tones that they're used to that they've been listening to for half an hour as sounding higher than what they're used to. And the person who's been exposed to the music in the yellow scale is going to be hearing exactly the same sounds, only it's going to sound that some of the pitches are lower than what they're used to. And remember what they're gonna do is judge how sad does this melody sound? So now we're gonna be able to compare two people hearing exactly the same sound one hearing some of them as lower, one hearing some of the pitches as higher, and compare how they judge the sadness. So what are the results? The results are that lower than normal pitch is perceived as sadder. By the way, that description that I gave you with generating a random scale, doing the derivatives and having two participants, we start, we do that all over again with each pair of participants. So each pair of participants gets a completely new scale, completely new set of obscure German folk songs, it's all, and then we just keep repeating it uh, for a whole bunch of different pairs of participants, but the results are the same. Okay, so now if we ask, why does the minor scale sound sad for Western enculturated listeners? we have to ask the question, what is normal for Western enculturated listeners? What do they expect to have happen? So depending on the type of music you listen to, between 65 and 95% of all music heard in the West is in the major mode. And what we've done in our research is we've shown that when people hear an unfamiliar melody for the first time, they assume that it's going to be in the major mode. It's only if they have in, uh, uh, information to the contrary that they'll, think, that they'll switch over and start hearing it in the minor mode. So in the Western enculturated culture, the culture that we're, probably every one of my listeners is, is engaged in, is the major mode is the norm. Okay, so now what's the difference with the minor scale? The minor scale takes some of the pitches in the major scale and lowers them. So let's go back to our Bulgarian exception. And we can ask, so why does the minor mode not associated with sadness in traditional music of the Middle East, North Africa, or Balkan music? And here we can do something, for example, we can uh, pick up the telephone and call Tim Rice, one of the world's foremost authorities at uh, UCLA uh, in Bulgarian music and ask Tim, what, are, what scales are used in traditional Bulgarian music? And what he'll tell us is that there are four traditional scales. The most commonly used scale is uh, basically an equivalent to the Western minor scale and they do not use the major scale. So because the major mode is not the norm, they do not hear any of the pitches as sounding lower than normal. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip over. We've done a lot of cross-cultural research, but we've shown exactly the same thing um, with regard to um, uh, um, rags in India. Uh, the rags that have the most lower pitches are the ones that uh, um, uh, people who are familiar with Hindustani traditional music will judge to be uh, sadder. Okay. Um, well, the minor mode in the West, we lower uh, tones three, six, and seven, and sometimes seven, but there are other tones as well. And if this was a, were a general principle, can we see the same effect if we were to lower the other pitches? So we can't lower scale degree four or one because they just end up um, becoming three and seven. So uh, yeah, the tones that we can uh, manipulate the, apart from three, uh, five, and seven are then five and two. And if we lower five, what we end up with is the blue scale. So yet another form of sadness. What about lowering uh, two? Here, there's a lot of fun. This lovely work I've discovered by Sarah Moore, an ethnomusicologist, a British ethnomusicologist, 
who did a wonderful um, piece of research specifically about lowering scale degree two in different cultures. So she interviewed musicians from four contrasting cultures, traditional Turkish Makam music, traditional North Indian music, klezmer music, and heavy metal. Mm -hmm. And her research question is, how is the lowered two used and what is its emotional impact? So in the case of Turkish Makam music, what she found was that flat two or lowered two is associated with sadness, with nostalgia, melancholy, and mourning. In the case of North Indian rags, the use of flat two or lowered two is associated with relaxed, sad, morose, and melancholic feelings. It's also associated with dawn, dusk, and sleepiness. And in klezmer music, it's associated with nostalgia and the sad, painful history of the Jewish people. And then what happened in the case of heavy metal? Ah, it's associated with aggression, darkness, power, masculinity, ominousness. Okay, so on the one hand, she's found in Turkish Makam, Indian rags, and klezmer music that the lowered two was associated with sadness, but the heavy metal was a real exception here. Flat two here was associated with aggression. So why such a difference in effect of connotation? And the main difference, of course, is that heavy metal is really loud music. It's not quiet music. And when we lower it to in these other forms of music, it's associated with sadness, but lowering to when it's loud is associated with aggression or seriousness. So in effect, what we have is we're back to the acoustic ethological model. That is lower than normal when it's quiet is associated with sadness, sleepiness. Remember that's right there in certain rags that are played at uh, uh, dawn and dusk in, uh, in India uh, and relaxed music. And when it's loud, associated with aggression. Okay, so let's just skip ahead here. Uh, we've got one more musical example I'd like to play. One thing to say about these two forms of sadness, um, mourning and grief. If, if your pet dog dies or something terrible happens, you're likely to have periods of, uh, of grief where you're actually um, actively grieving and crying, interspersed with periods of quiescent melancholy where you're, where you're just uh, sad. We call this alternation back and forth between these two, the mourning cycle. You will see evidence of the mourning cycle in music in Barber's Adagio for strings. So those two passages, the first passage that was quiet and slow, this was essentially a representation of melancholy. That louder, intense, high passage is a representation of a grief uh, component. Um, okay. Uh, oh, be so, uh, in the interest of time, let's, uh, maybe later we'll li listen to Chris Isaac's Wicked Game and we'll uh, annotate these things. It would be nice to leave some time for questions here. Uh, but let's move on to the part two. And you may be a little bit worried here. It won't take very long to get through part two. Why do some people enjoy listening to sad music? So we've addressed the question of what makes a sound sound sad. And now we need uh, the enjoyment question. So recall that only about half of listeners enjoy listening to nominally sad music. <clears throat> so what distinguishes these two groups of people? So there are at least two possibilities. It could be that it's differences in past experience, differences of enculturation or associations, or there could be some trait dispositions. Maybe it's related in personalities to some, in some way, or maybe it's a combination of both trait dispositions and past experience. So we should consider how people respond to the sadness of others. So the consequence of crying is that if you're engaged in an aggressive uh, interaction, typically the crying brings the aggression to an end. And otherwise it encourages altruistic behaviors. When we encounter someone who's crying, our natural disposition is to want to help. So we could, should ask, um, uh, why is it that, uh, why should we help someone who's sad? Um, so I, I'm going to skip over this too. There are excellent reasons why we should help people who are sad. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and there are excellent biological reasons why we might do this, but there are also proximal motivations for this. And the proximal motivation is that altruistic acts are enjoyable. So Thomas Hobbes, St. Augustine, Immanuel Kant, all regarded acts of charity as not truly altruistic because they make us feel good. And Kant in particular regarded charity as a form of selfish pleasure. Mm. So if we consider research, there's a lot of research that exists investigating the phenomena of empathy. And the best model here is a model that was produced by Davis way back in the 1980s of, that contains four components or facets. Let's go through these quickly. 
One of these facets is empathetic concern or what we're gonna call compassion. It's the disposition to feel concern, sympathy, or compassion for another person experiencing some stress or misfortune. We might summarize this facet of empathy via the statement, I feel sympathy for you. Oops. Secondly, personal distress, or what we're going to call commiseration. It's the disposition to mirror or echo feelings of personal anxiety or unease when witnessing stress or tension in others. And we might represent this by the feeling, I feel your pain. I can partake of your pain. Thirdly, perspective taking is the cognitive tendency to spontaneously adopt the psychological point of view of others. I understand where you're coming from. And finally, what's called fantasy. It's the ability to be absorbed and to imagine the feeling state for fictional character, such as portrayed in literature, drama, or fil film. So we might summarize that by, I can, I can imagine that situation. Okay, so if we just look at compassion now, it turns out that there are studies that show that compassion, the feeling of compassion is enjoyable. Neuroimaging studies indicate that the feeling of compassion are associated with activity in what's called the medial forebrain, forebrain pleasure circuit. So it's strongly associated with activation of regions of the brain that are associated with enjoyment or pleasure. The feeling of compassion is positive even when the compassion doesn't lead to overt altruistic acts. So even if you just feel, oh, I maybe I should help out, even if you don't help, the positive feeling is still going to be there. So is there any difference in empathetic responses between sad music likers and sad music dislikers? And the answer is yes. Those listeners who most enjoy sad music score high on empathetic concern. That is, they, it generates a lot of feelings of compassion and also fantasy or absorption with only nominal levels of this distress component or commiseration. That is nominal levels of, I feel your pain. This result has now been replicated in multiple studies, including studies in Finland, mm. Japan, and Austria. So the expression of sadness, such as weeping, evokes positive feelings of compassion in observers. And then what happens is those people who feel mostly compassion with rather subdued amounts of commiseration, they're mostly having a positive experience. Those people who are strong and feel a lot of commiseration, I feel your pain, and who feel less of the compa uh, compassion component, it's mostly a negative experience. And so they don't like listening to the music. Okay, let's just skip ahead here and do our little summary. Sad music emulates the features of sad human vocalizations. However, there are two different forms of sadness with distinct acoustical features. There's the melancholic uh, expression and there's the grief or high arousal expressions. Humans are extraordinarily sensitive in recognizing when others are sad. And we have a strong disposition to come to the assistance of others in distress. Although instrumental music may seem devoid of agency or persona, some people are more prone to hear the music as an expression of a sad actor or sad agent. And these people, those people who score high on empathetic, um, uh, have high empathetic personality trait known as fantasy, I can imagine that situation. Those are the people who tend to hear it that way. So empathy, empathy involves at least two other components. The contagious component, I feel your pain, and the repercussive component, the feeling of compassion. So as I mentioned, com commiseration is unpleasant. It's a negatively valenced emotion, whereas compassion is a positively or pleasant emotion. People differ with respect to the trait dispositions of commiseration and compassion. If your experience of sad music is dominated by a feeling of compassion, then you'll tend to enjoy the music. If your experience of sad music is dominated by commiseration, then you'll tend not to enjoy the music. Hmm. Since it seems weird to think of music as evoking compassion, we tend not to use the word compassion. We don't say, oh, that's very compassionate music. It makes me feel very compassionate. Instead, because it doesn't seem appropriate somehow to describe music that way. So we re rely on more, more nebulous descriptions of our feelings. We say, I, it makes, I feel touched, or uh, I feel make, the music may, has moved me. And finally, grief expressions are more easily recognized than melancholic expressions. So passages that are slow, low, quiet, and legato can also be interpreted in other ways as melancholic or relaxing or peaceful music. Uh, and people who score high on a trait called neuroticism are more likely to interpret music exhibiting low arousal sounds 
as sad compared with listeners who score low on trait neuroticism. And with that, I think we can stop here. And I hope I've left a little bit of time for some questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, sorry, I had to get my mic turned back on. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to applaud for everyone. Oh, thank you. And, and thank you very much for the presentation. I'm sure uh, there's a lot left to think about after that. Um, let's see if some, uh, why don't we do it this way? If someone has a question, please turn your mic on and simply identify yourself. <laughs> announce your name and ask your question. I have one. Elizabeth Davis here. Uh -huh. may, may I go ahead and ask a question? Yes. yes. Um, uh, let's see, David, I wanted to know what, it, what your thoughts are about this tendency to like sad music being somehow innate. Um, or whether it, it is a learned thing. Uh, I, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. One time I was sitting in the living room of a colleague in Spain and we were listening to the radio. You know, We were listening to classical music, I believe. And his son, who must have been about eight years old at the time, came into the room to say hello, you know, very sociable kid. And, very sweet kid, and he um, he just burst into tears, mm -hmm. and we didn't, you know, and, until my friend asked him what was going on. He just he he wasn't able. He just said the music, you know, and I had never. I mean, I ha I have my own feelings about these topics. I mean, this about sad music and um, and. And so I was really intrigued by the topic of your talk, but that example to me just was just pretty crystal clear. And I, I can't imagine what he could have learned that would have made it so, that happen to him. So just a, a question of clarification, Elizabeth. So was there music playing? Was he just he came in and just started, started crying, or it, was there? Yes, we were listening. We were listening to classical music. I ah. Right. And something in this music just, you know, he, I mean, it was just the most, it was just the purest kind of most innocent reaction mm -hmm. I had ever seen of that intensity, you know. That's a, a lovely story. I, th I think one of the things to recognize about crying is that uh, we tend to think of, when we think of crying, we immediately think of grief. But there are lots of situations uh, other than grief that will bring tears to your eyes. Um, so, you know, classically, you know, the, the, the beauty co contest winner that receives the bouquet of roses and the crown and so on, and then bursts and, you know, has, has tears in her eyes, um, uh, or the experience that we can have of where we're laughing and we end up laughing to the point that we, we start generating tears and so on. There, um, and, and this is also true of the case of laughter, for example. We can laugh because we're feeling joyous or uh, playful, um, but we can laugh um, from nervousness um, uh, when we're fearful. Uh, we can laugh in a mocking fashion by mocking some, someone and so forth. So um, in each of these cases of these displays, um, smiling, same thing with smiling. We smile when we're happy, but we, we also smile when we're nervous or trying to be polite and so on. Um, what's essential to understand in the emotion uh, world is that the displays of these things um, are only tenuously related to the affect that's generating them. So it's very hard to actually infer what's, what emotion is generating uh, the, the particular display without some sort of other, other information. Usually context tells us whether the laughter is from joy or mocking laughter or whatever. But um, it, unless we know a lot about the context, it's often difficult to know what's going on. So that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to stick my neck out on this occasion and say what was going on for this young boy that, that, that made that work. But if it was a pleasurable experience um, for, the, for the, the boy, often what we call beautiful is something that's pleasurable. And when, under intense pleasurable situations, we tend to say, that, well, the reason why 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing this is because it's beautiful. Um, I tend to think more biologically, what do we, we need to cash out what we mean by beauty? And it usually needs to be cashed out in terms of what experience a person is having rather than positing some sort of abstract entity apart from human psychology. I'm sorry, I really didn't answer your question, did I? <laughs> I have a question too, it's William Clark. It's, I find these two forms of music which I, I've always been drawn to, and I mentioned the context, the classic sad music of American blues, and also uh, Irish Celtic music and all those minor keys and, and, and you know, desperate grief in them. Um, have you looked at how do those fit in your structure, the perception of these keys and in, in why we listen to sad music? Because I love listening to it. You know, so. Yeah, um, so excellent. One thing we didn't talk about um, is that there's yet a third form of sadness and that's nostalgia. So, and nostalgia is unusual with regard to these, these other forms of melancholy and grief, which are uh, negatively valenced affects. Nostalgia classically has this um, uh, bittersweet quality that people will talk about of mixture of sad and happy. And so uh, for many people, and I, I'm uh, not positing this in, in your case, uh, Bill, that it, it may be that in, for a lot of Irish uh, folk um, music, traditional uh, Irish music, there's often a strong nostalgic component uh, to it, especially if you were you know, raised on this when you were young, uh, much, much younger. But my guess is that there's, there's a bunch of things going on there. And my guess is that nostalgia is playing a, a pretty important role there too. That's a whole other lecture. That's a whole other story. And there's a wonderful sort of biological, uh, biologically and culturally, I, let, let me put it in context, um, um, bio, psycho, socio, cultural ex account of nostalgia that's really uh, I think a wonderful way of inter interpreting what's going on. Yeah. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is Pat Osmer. I have a comment and a question. Sure. And um, first of all, I too and greatly enjoyed your talk and it made me think about music and major and minor keys in entirely different ways. I know something about music mostly. I like listening, or I have among many things, listen to a lot of classical music. And, and picked up on the difference between major and minor keys, but it never really occurred to me to describe them the way you just, or you did, happy, sad. Uh, and you gave an example, for example, the Beethoven Sonata is, is pretty dramatic and it's, it's just a one way of expressing things. But say, I would have said, say, consider, well, you know, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto is pretty deep, pretty profound. It's not, I guess in the category, it's it's sad, but I, I think it's also very popular, isn't it? <laughs> so it's where I'm going is for me, I think the, the minor keys often express a kind of deeper, more profound or on you know, different emotions than, than things in, in major keys. Uh, and uh, as compared to, um, or, you know, take um, Brahms' first piano concerto, I guess in your category would be more on the, maybe the aggressive side actually, because it is really dramatic and it's in D minor, you know? So uh, I, um, I was just, I just curious, uh, or I want to ex express that because um, I, I realized in my life, I was probably exposed to a number of classical things in, D, in minor keys without at that point realizing it. Um, but I just felt they, they give a, a broader, uh, together with major, then you, you get a broader sense of the, all the emotional uh, uh, factors in, in music. And so I just, yeah. Let me add to what you've just said by saying that one of the things that's very characteristic about music with regard to emotion is that it changes dramatically very quickly. Yeah. So, um, so it, this is not like looking at a painting where there's a sort of static aura that will sort of envelop you as you as, uh, emotionally. M music is changing dramatically second by second. So I had uh, um, a former doctoral student, uh, um, uh, um, uh, Josh Albrecht, who did a wonderful um, uh, computer model that takes as a musical score and is actually able to predict moment by moment what the affective components, when you add this uh, note now, when this moment, and yeah. now when you make this little crescendo, what happens? So we're really, yeah. you know, only on the, uh, on the leading edge of really trying to chronicle these tiny moment by moment changes, which are so integral to what the musical experience is all about. Yeah, thank you. Let me say, just while we're waiting, one of the wonderful things about, um, I feel very blessed to have been able to study music. 
you know, there are a lot of pleasurable things that people can do in life. Uh, you can you could smoke cigarettes, you can drink alcohol, you can you can get really in, in, engaged in gambling and so on. Those are pleasurable activities. But you know, the wonderful thing about music is there's not much of a downside to it. You don't feel you don't see people on the street. Um, with their tin can out there saying, please, I only need two more dollars and then I can get into this concert. Um, you know, it's not associated with marginal existence. And it, it's, it's nice to be able to study something that's mostly just gives enormous amount of pleasure to billions of people on the planet with rather little downside. Are there more questions or comments? Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation, Ardine, for uh, being able to give a lecture today. Oh, it, it's, it's our pleasure and honor to have you as our last lecture of this season. Is that a proper way to say it? Thank you. Um, so if no one else has any other comments or questions, once again, thank you so much. I have one quick. I have one quick thing to ask. Um, you have quite a lot of references. Do you have a list for us? Uh, sure, if you write to me, I, I can send you, there's probably uh, three dozen articles that we've done it, it just in my lab, um, but there's, there's quite a bit. Uh, but let me send you the main article that describes the theory here and puts it in context. That was written, published just last year in Frontiers in Psychology. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, once again, thank you so very much for today. And for everyone in the Academy, have more plus. <laughs> for everyone in the Academy, um, have a wonderful summer, safe, healthy, and we will see you in the autumn either in person or on Zoom or in a combination or whatever that might be. Oh, by the way, I was going to mention, you know, we've had uh, Zoom participants from outside of the United States, which is one of the things that's happened because of Zoom. So do tell your friends, colleagues around the world, everything is at the website, um, all the videos or from this year, the Zoom lectures, and they're available to see. So, wonderful summer. See you in the autumn. Bye. <laughs>